We're going to take it from two sides tonight. Uh, with me tonight is my old friend Charlie Rose, who is now the co-host of uh, CBS This Morning. He can, I don't know how he does it. I don't know when he sleeps. He continues to do the Charlie Rose show at night. I'm told he takes short naps during the day, but he's just on television all the time. Uh, Charlie Rose, the first Charlie Rose show was actually on Channel 5 here in Fort Worth. And I remember when that happened. I've worked at uh, Channel 5 for a time. But Charlie uh, uh, is, is the voice of experience. You hadn't really made it until you've been interviewed by Charlie Rose. So Charlie, come on out and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second person with us is somebody, uh, when I was the White House correspondent covering the Ford administration, uh, he was working for the Washington Star in those days. He went on to make a, a real name for himself in journalism, along with Bill Kristol. He was the co-founder of the Weekly Standard, which of course is pretty much the voice uh, of the Republican Party, the, I would say the the middle part of, of the Republican Party, well respected uh, by people on all sides of the political spectrum, Fred Barnes. <laughs> Fred's not sure he wants to be called a voice for the middle of the Republican Party <laughs> here yet. But anyway, they will serve very well uh, for the uh, voice of experience side of, of broadcast uh, and, and print journalism. They're, you know, they're not as old as me, but they're, they're getting there. <laughs> now I'm going to introduce to you two of the most amazing young women uh, in journalism today. Uh, you know, when I was growing up and, and sort of went into journalism, Covering wars, being foreign correspondents, was something that was pretty much 99% of the people who, who did that kind of work uh, were men, mostly uh, young men. That is no longer the case, as is the case across journalism. Most of the people going into journalism now are women. And uh, we have two of the best tonight. The first is Nancy Youssef. She was the Pentagon correspondent uh, for the McClatchy newspapers. Uh, her byline, of course, appears in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, which is a, a McClatchy newspaper. She has probably spent more time in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, than any other reporter. Uh, she is now the Middle East Bureau Chief for, uh, for McClatchy, based in Cairo. She was there for the Arab Spring and covered all of that. Nancy Youssef. And finally, the person who won every award there was to win last year uh, in journalism, in broadcast journalism, she was the first reporter who went undercover and snuck into Syria and brought out the first pictures of the Syrian civil war. Up until that point, it was something we were all just talking about and taking uh, pictures off the satellite that had been uh, released uh, by the Syrian government. She risked her life many times, got in there undercover, and got out. She has been back to Syria five times. Uh, she only speaks, I think, six languages at last report. Uh, a remarkable young woman and a terrific reporter, Clarissa Ward of CBS News. So, I, uh, Clarissa, Clarissa, I want to just start with you because uh, you're just back from Syria. She, uh, she, by the way, Clarissa flew here from London. She was in Syria and then was in London for a week and flew in uh, last night uh, from London. Uh, you got in and out alive again. And uh, what is it like now trying to cover this war? 
um, I think it's definitely the most challenging environment I've ever had to work in as a journalist. We're uh, accustomed to taking risks. We're accustomed to being in conflict zones where uh, there may be shelling going around, around you. There may be bombing. You may be a target, um, as many journalists were in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but what is uniquely challenging about Syria is that um, there, you don't really have an escape route, per se. If something really bad happens to you in Syria, you're kind of at the mercy of uh, your prior planning and the gods, essentially, because unlike Iraq or Afghanistan, where you were probably embedded with the military, where you would have access to the best medical evacuation um, and the best medical care, uh, when you're inside Syria, you're living in and among the people, traveling, traveling with rebel fighters. You don't have access to good medical care. Um, you often don't have access to regular meals. And, um, and it's very difficult because you don't have an escape as well on an emotional level. Um, usually you go as a journalist and at the end of the day you can go back to the hotel, maybe if you're really lucky you can have a beer. Um, but you have that space to just kind of decompress for a moment and take a breath and try to uh, you know, really process everything that you've seen that day or that week. And in Syria, you don't, there are no hotels for journalists, you're living with these people in their houses. Their hell is your hell. Uh, you're with them you know, when they're next door neighbor, as happened in my last trip. The house next door to me um, was bombed one day while we were there. The woman who was living in it, who we had met the day before, was killed. And you're living with these people as they're trying to deal with their grief. One of the women was sort of shivering uncontrollably, and she was hallucinating and, and, and screaming, Tayara, Tayara, with plain, plain. Uh, over and over again throughout the night. And you're, you're living there with them. You, you can't run away from it. Their, their pain, their grief, their suffering is in your face at all times. And well, that now, takes a toll. The, the Syrian government obviously knows by this point who you are. Oh, yeah. I think they know. Is there <laughs> a price on your head? I have been told that I'm on a blacklist. Um, I have been told that I should never apply for an official visa because there would potentially be a chance that I would get the visa and that would, that would be some kind of a trick, essentially. Um, so I know that I'm uh, you know, known to the Syrian regime and certainly we've had, you know, on this last trip we had a couple of close calls where uh, I was a little bit concerned that potentially somehow uh, the government or was somehow aware of where we were, the fact that we were in that area and that potentially we were attracting um, some fire, uh, which is obviously a deeply uncomfortable position because as a journalist, one is trying to help people by telling their stories, not uh, put them in harm's way by drawing attention to where they are. But you don't even take a cell phone with you when you go in. Oh, no. Here you'll be no. pinpointed. Don't take cell phones. Uh, we take a, a satellite phone with us, and it's a specific brand of satellite phones. The Raya's can be triangulated by the Syrian government, so we take a satellite phone called an Iridium. Even with the Iridium, um, we would drive like a mile outside of town, put the battery in the phone, make the call quickly, take the battery out again, and drive back into town. Um, and we had discussed earlier, a lot of journalists these days are traveling with GPS trackers, which basically means I don't need to call uh, my bosses in London at all because every five minutes a short burst of information uh, is transmitted from the GPS tracker that tells people in London exactly where we are. But there is still a lot of controversy about using these um, because they can, uh, you know, they can make people who you're staying with uh, very skeptical of who you are. There's already a perception uh, in a lot of places in the Middle East that any American journalist is CIA or Mossad. Um, so people can get really freaked out by these GPS trackers, and especially because they don't really understand how the technology works. So they think that, oh, this means that the regime can spot us. And yeah. so every trip you have to do it differently. Nancy, how is Afghanistan and Pakistan different from what Clarissa covers in uh, in Syria. Well, uh, uh, Clarissa hit on it in the sense that you have a state that you're dealing with, that, that there's some structure there. And so um, you're working within those parameters. You're not working within um, a, a collapsed system. Um, and, and, and in Iraq, it was that, that way as well. I mean, whatever happened, there was always the, the, the presence of um, the US military. I spent a lot of time in Libya during the uprising there, which is the closest thing where there wasn't a state and there wasn't any resource you could go to, you're in the country illegally, and if anything happens, 
you're at the mercy of the Gaddafi government as it's fighting um, um, a war there. Um, I think what's different in all of these is the duration of the conflict there and the, and the sort of the absoluteness of it. That is, in Syria, um, if you're um, with the regime and, and, and you lose, then, then, the, then the Sunnis will, will kill you, will annihilate you, that there has to be absolute victory, at least that's the perception in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or in Pakistan, that there's still room to negotiate and backroom deals that can happen that, 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 that doesn't really seem to apply to Syria right, right now. Um, so I think those are, those are the biggest differences that I see as a conflict reporter. That the, and, and it happens, frankly, with every conflict I've covered. I've, I started with Iraq and, um, and, and then uh, did Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Bahrain, Libya, and now Egypt. Where, where the state of warfare becomes the, the, the definition of warfare and the, and the front lines, it becomes muddier and muddier. In 2003 in Iraq, it seemed so new to think of a front line as a Humvee driving through a neighborhood, and that that was the front line. Who was inside the vehicle and who was outside the vehicle, that was the front line. And here in Syria and again in Libya, that, that would be a luxury in terms of um, defining the parameters of what warfare is. And so. As a journalist, to me, that's the most shocking thing, that the, the collapse of, of any sort of sense of where warfare begins and ends. And I've seen that increasingly disappear with every conflict that I've covered. So what would you guys add? <laughs> <laughs> How's it going in your world? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that sounds so exciting. <laughs> I'm stuck in Washington. <laughs> Jeez, well, it, you know, Bob, as you know, there's very little uh, uh, going on in in Washington, and it's amazing that <laughs> that the uh, uh, the buzz in Washington right now is who's going to run, who's going to win in 2016. <laughs> really, there are all these stories about Hillary Clinton and is she beatable or not, and so on. Uh, and meanwhile, um, any agreement on on gun control or on immigration or on spending and taxes uh, are going to be very very hard to reach. Anything on gun control will be background checks expanded, at, if that, and immigration, I think the first mistake was that was to say we have to have a comprehensive immigration reform bill. Well, we don't have to have a comprehensive bill. It'd be nice to have, have something because the whole immigration system is in horrible shape. Uh, and then there's spending in the budget and, and, and taxes, which uh, the Republicans, we've seen the budgets now, President Obama's was two months late, but uh, they're as far apart as ever. And for some reason, uh, there is not the expectation in Washington about what there, ha and in the media as well, there has been over the years in America, and that is when you do have a stalemate, uh, when no progress is being made, the president steps forward and gets one. I mean, think of someone, not LBJ, but someone like LBJ, uh, who can step in and say, look, we're going to have a deal uh, because I'm going to get one. I'm going to get together with these two people privately or, or one person, and we're going to hammer it out, and I will do whatever I have to uh, to get a deal. Uh, that's not happening. Charlie, uh, add on to that. You and I have been watching Washington and, right. and all of these events for a long, long time. How do you judge the state of things right now? I mean, I, I'll, be, I'll put in a... Uh, my personal opinion is I've never seen the partisan divide as wide, or I would also say as deep as it is now. Uh, what's your sense of it? Well, the same thing, Bob. Let me just say how nice it is to be home, to come back to Fort Worth. Uh, when, I, when I left here in 1980, Bob Schieffer was a legend, and I come back and he's still a legend. <laughs> Some things never change. Uh, except when I drove in today, I, I kept seeing these purple signs saying, Schieffer event this way. Uh, so I, I'm, it's great to be home. And, and last time I checked, Bob and I uh, were, were of the same generation. And, and also, he's reporting from Washington. I'm reporting from New York. And, and we do try to, to get out and, and where things are happening, whether it's Rome, where they're changing the Pope. But, but certainly, uh, there is much to be admired by the kind of journalism that they are doing in terms of putting their life on the line. And we've seen with other correspondents who've lost their life and who have, in fact, uh, or have been captive in not knowing uh, what the danger is and, and, and what efforts people are going 
uh, to find the story. And, and often in an environment in which you don't know who your enemy is or who your friend is and, and who you think is on the same side may be competing with each other and there's much to be gained by uh, finding something that you can trade. But I've never seen it either, Bob. I, I, I had hoped that, you know, after the election, the president had said after the election um, that elections have consequences. Now, the consequences he seems to have believed in were the notion that, uh, that somehow he would have more power to do more things. Uh, I am, and I am hopeful, uh, even though we don't see the results yet, although we may see on the filibuster vote, and we may see in terms of what Manchin is doing with Tooney, some progress, but I, 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 at long last, the president is reaching across the aisle in an interesting way. Uh, I'm not in those meetings and I'm not there. Um, Bob knows more about that than I do, but you hope that somehow I have always believed and Fred suggested LBJ uh, and, and how he handled it and, and the extraordinary capacity he had in a sense to get people by putting them in a room and saying you're not leaving uh, until we have an agreement. <laughs> and I happen to have the key and until you do that, you know, and, and the capacity to trade. I don't know if that's part of the temperament of this president, you would know better. But I am optimistic a little bit because that's taking place, even as bad as things are. I think things might be, uh, I think there actually is uh, the possibility that something, I'm not sure how, how major it's going to be, but something may actually happen on immigration uh, reform. But, you know, we've got miles to go. And, and how about gun we, control? Uh, something. I would, my sense of it is that they may do something on background checks, but even that's going to be, be very difficult. But, uh, I, you know, assault weapons ban, large magazines, I, I just think the votes right now are, are not there for that. Yeah, the problem is on, on immigration is it is such a big issue that it transcends Congress and the president really doesn't have uh, influence on it. Perhaps it's because of the second term, perhaps yeah. because it's but, an issue that's been around for so many years. Uh, and, the, and the real hope there is this gang of eight, four Democratic senators, four Republican senators, who've come together on a compromise bill. And I'll have to say, uh, Chuck Schumer, the leading Democrat, has actually uh, uh, given up a lot of ground on this. So it's a very good bill, but there, there's still a lot of liberal Democrats who don't like it, and there are a lot yeah. of conservative Republicans who don't like it. But, but uh, did, you, did you make any progress because of the, the election, and they do have results, and Republicans realized that with respect to the uh, Latino vote, they had to change, and you see people like Rubio trying to get out front. Well, uh, he's out front. The others are people who've been there, John McCain, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who are ones who've been for immigration reform all along. Rubio's the key character here for the Republicans, because if they can uh, finish a compromise, and they're supposed to announce something tomorrow uh, that has border security and has a time when the, uh, the, the, uh, the people who came here illegally are, are become legal, and then after that uh, have a path to citizenship, if they can agree on that and Rubio goes along, there's a chance of winning a lot of Republican votes. You know, and, and I, passing a bill. I, I, I just want to pick up on something uh, Charlie said about the way it used to be and kind of the way it is now. And, and here is how it used to be. I had a friend, I have a friend, he's a friend of 40 years named Bill Stuckey. It's the Stuckey stores, you remember, uh, that were all over America. Stop at Stuckey's and get gas. That was their <laughs> motto. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> there were 400 of them, so it must have been a good, it must have been a good slogan. Good business. But uh, Bill was from Eastman, Georgia, and when he was young, he was in his 20s, he, he decided to uh, run for Congress, and he won the Democratic uh, nomination uh, from Eastman, Georgia. That was tantamount to uh, uh, victory in those days because there were no Republicans in Georgia. And the next day after the election, he got a call from the White House, and they said, President Johnson would like to see you. And he said, oh, I'm so thrilled. He said, I'll, I'll, uh, when I get to Washington, he said, no, no, the president wants to see you tomorrow. <laughs> and he said, well, how would I? He said, we're sending a plane for you. The next morning, part of the Air Force One fleet, one of the smaller planes, landed at the little airport in Eastman, Georgia, picked up Bill Stuckey, flew him directly to Andrews Air Force Base. When he got off the plane, they put him on a helicopter, flew him directly to the south lawn of the White House. The helicopter landed an aide, he was Barefoot Sanders from Texas who worked for Lyndon in those days. 
He met him at the helicopter door, took him around directly into the Oval Office, and there stood the President of the United States who walked up to him, put his arm around him, and said, son, I'm really going to need you. <laughs> Bill Stuckey said he never once voted against, Lin against Lyndon Johnson after that. That is the part we're not seeing in Washington. There's a whole different kind of negotiating that's going on. I don't understand yeah, right. it. I mean, now, Just a, a side note, that reminds me of all the Lyndon Johnson stories. Some of them are, are in the magnificent Robert Caro biographies. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson would also probably say to Mr. Stuckey, you are a rare and great American. There are few like you, and your country needs you, and your country needs you, and your president needs you. But don't forget how important you are to the future of this country, and what you do will be decisive. And, you know, I mean, we could use a little of that these days. I mean, I just don't but think... It's a serious conversation as to whether, and you guys know better than I, is, is to whether, why the president hasn't done that. Is, does he not believe it has results, which is, he's often said, I don't think smoozing makes a difference in the end, or is it because it's just not part of his makeup, his DNA? I think you're right about the second part, but presidents, you know, uh, it was, uh, Stuckey was a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, Presidents used to reach across the aisle and try to have one or two people they were close to and could rely on to talk to and maybe get their vote sometime and bring some other people with them. Members of the other party. Yeah. Remember Richard Nixon had Joe Wagner yeah, of Louisiana. But, but, and Everett who, Dirksen is a classic case. And Everett Dirksen uh, as a Republican when LBJ was president. And, uh, and, uh, and presidents don't do that anymore. Look, Ronald Reagan used to invite uh, uh, Democrats in all the time. And if you remember, Ronald Reagan, in 1981, his tax cut bill and his spending cut bill, on the tax cut bill, I believe his, uh, uh, his uh, Democratic uh, co-sponsor was Phil Graham, or maybe it was Kent Hans, and the other one, you know, both uh, Texas Democrats. But, but those you, Texas Democrats now are both Republicans. You're not seeing that coming now from the Congress, and you're not seeing it come from the White House. I'm not saying they're doing it a bad way now, no. but it's just very different. I want to ask both of you, because you view the United States uh, and you see uh, and get the reaction of people in faraway places. Nancy, uh, what's going to happen now in Afghanistan? I mean, my sense of it is we're out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> Full stop. And what happens after that? Uh, I think the real fighting begins because, um, you know, it's astonishing to, when you go to Afghanistan in 2002, 2006, 2008, 2010, and now, is how, for all the money invested, how little's changed and how many years they've been sort of taking our resources, not towards building a, a unified state under the leadership of Hamid Karzai, but to put those resources towards the war that they've seen as inevitable in, in the post-U.S. Um, period. And, and that's what I find extraordinary. I talk to troops all the time who are based there, and their mission isn't, um, to win a war, it's to reduce casualties. And so that's, that's not a way to fight. And you get the sense that because of the lack of progress, that the, that the, that the goal is simply to minimize the damage from here going forward. And it's extraordinary to go there um, and, and see that the, 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 in Afghanistan you recognized in 2006. And um, the idea that, that Hamid Karzai could lead the state on his own or that the Afghan army could do it, um, this is not a country that's sort of being geared towards thinking in those terms. Do you think they can handle their own security when the United States leaves? No. <laughs> no, not at all. No. So if they can, what happens? I think there's, uh, sorry for just jumping in a little bit, I think there's two main problems, arguably, that, you know, one can't say that the U.S. is responsible for them, but um, two issues that we haven't really been able to give the Afghans an indigenous economy, right? The economy in Afghanistan now is an economy of war. There's no money in peace for Afghan people as they see it at the moment. There's a lot of money in war and the money's flooding in when there's war. When there's not war, what are they left with? All of their incredible handicrafts and trades that they have, uh, which you know people would buy from all over the world, it's so expensive to hire workers and it's so inefficient the way the whole sort of production line works that it ends up being totally unfeasible and all of that stuff 
is made in Pakistan as a result. So I think that's one problem that's it's going to be pretty significant. When all that international funding goes out, Afghanistan's economy is sort of headed to a deep and dark place. The second problem, I think, that we haven't really addressed is that the Taliban and the supporters of Hamid Karzai and his government still hate each other just as much as they did when they were killing each other in a brutal civil war 20 years ago. And the reality is that, you know, while we'd like to sort of think in, uh, you know, polarized world where there's good guys and bad guys and the Taliban were the bad guys and we killed the bad guys and so the good guys won, this, the reality on the ground is much more nuanced, it's much more complex. And for me, and I think many others who've spent a lot of time there, it's very hard to envision how there can be uh, any peace in Afghanistan after U.S. and NATO forces pull out unless the building blocks of some type of a peace agreement between the Taliban and between Karzai's government uh, involving Pakistan are already in place. Because as it stands, exactly what Nancy says, you pull out, what do you think is going to happen? They're all going to sit there like, you know, just chilling out? No, they're going to start they're going to start fighting again and, and fighting very heavily. That has to be some agreement or incentive or the building blocks for that agreement in place before we leave. But we're not in that, we're not thinking in those terms. We're thinking in terms of exit and minimizing. Well, Holbrook yeah. was thinking in those right, terms. Right, that was and, years and, ago. And yeah. he was, you know, I'm, according to this new book, he was sidelined. He was. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I point to this 25 year old State Department employee who was killed. Um, last week. Who is a friend of both Who of Who I yours. knew, and it's, it's unbelievably sad. And, yeah. and what's, for me personally, frustrating about the whole thing is, you know, it's being present, you know, we're still worried about optics rather than, you know, getting into the ground and fixing things because the story presented is that she was there delivering books. The reality is she was put in that dangerous position as a public affairs officer to go out with Afghan reporters to make sure that there was a good picture of U.S., the U.S. government giving out books to Afghans. Why endanger her for that? What, and the, the, the goal is optics rather than getting into the nitty gritty. You talk to State Department employees who are based in Kabul, they can't get out and do the kind of work that's needed to negotiate a deal because it's seen as too dangerous. But when it's for optics sake, when it's for pr promoting the U.S. and making it look good in front of Afghan reporters, we're willing to jeopardize somebody's life. That's not a commitment towards a long-term solution. That's not willing to go into to the nuance that's needed. I, I want to ask both of you, I want to get just get your take on, on Pakistan, which to me I think is one of the most difficult problems we have. Here's a, here's a country that has nuclear weapons and a bunch of them. Uh, and yet we have done given all this aid, we've used drones in there a lot of times when people didn't know we were doing. And yet, uh, I would say we rank even ahead of India as the most hated uh, country uh, as far as the Pakistani people are concerned. We're, what, we're not very popular. What's going on all. there? I mean, there, there's a, a lot going in there. I mean, I think that the American-Pakistani relationship is, is one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world at the moment. But it is also a completely dysfunctional relationship. And, uh, and it has been for some time. Now, if you talk to people in Pakistan, and you can understand why, you can understand why the Americans are mad as hell when, when they look at bin Laden turning up and he'd been sitting there for 10 years, you know, you can understand it. Then you look at it from the Pakistani side and they say, you know, before 9-11, we never had a single suicide bombing in Pakistan. Before Musharraf made a deal with, with President Bush to essentially be a part of the war on terror, we never had a suicide bombing in Pakistan. We didn't even know the Taliban didn't exist in our own country. They were in Af Afghanistan and, uh, and then sort of came in after the US invasion. So both sides have this very strong sense of being sort of, you know, that they've been done wrong by or whatever. Um, in the case of Afghanistan going forward, this relationship between Pakistan and the US has to has to be improved. Otherwise, you're looking at, you know, and I realize that's easier said than done. I can see Fred kind of giving me like a little bit, of the, <laughs> I get a little bit of the stink eye there, but no, but you know, it's, it's easier said than done. But if, that's, if that relationship cannot be normalized on some level, and I understand the challenges mm -hmm. of doing that, um, then you've really lost a kind of key ally, whether it's the sort of wife that you hate, it's still a key ally in that whole region. Uh, it's kind of a linchpin, so I don't know how we figure it out, but we need to figure it out. 
What are you, what's you know, your thought? I, I was just thinking the word I'd use is about the uh, Pakistani-American relationship. It needs to exist. Yeah. And one of the reasons was, uh, Bob, you mentioned it. They have nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, and, and we want to be there. It can be very painful. I mean, it's very easy for uh, politicians to say, that the Pakistanis hate us, let's just pull out of there. That's not a luxury we yeah, have. Yeah, because if the government collapsed and say, yeah. A terrorist yeah, organization, sure. Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. the the Taliban, or somebody mm -hmm. came in and they got their got those weapons. Sure, it's a whole mm -hmm. different deal. Well, well, they worry about that in Syria as well. Yeah, there are countries where th that we may not like, but where we need to have influence, and we need to have them be at, in at least to to some degree dependent on us for things. Mm -hmm. It may be for military aid only, but there, uh, and but there, but we need to stay involved. There's also the element of the ISI, uh, mm -hmm. which is the intelligence organization in Pakistan, and it has always been uh, the assumption that somehow they knew and were dealing, double dealing. Part of the reason was that you know, they felt they had a vested interest in Afghanistan, and their mortal enemy is India, and if they thought India would, would play a role, they wanted to make sure that, that they still had ties with the Taliban if they came to power. So uh, in the Taliban, I mean, the, the Pakistanis have never, in a sense, uh, fully disclosed what the ISI is doing and double deeding. I mean, I've interviewed a whole range of them, and, and including people, from the highest American officials from Panetta and, and a whole range of others. And they all say that we, we have no evidence that the Pakistanis knew, that the top leadership of the Pakistanis knew that bin Laden was there. No evidence, have seen no evidence. And on the other hand, if you ask them what about the middle level, they'll say, well, that's the question. So uh, they, they're, and, and at the same time, the Pakistanis were. You know, we're, we're embarrassed, uh, and the Army Chief of Staff was very embarrassed over the fact that, that what happened in terms of the, of the uh, mission to, that killed Osama bin Laden, not only the invasion of sovereignty, they didn't know, and the reason they didn't know is because the Americans didn't trust them uh, to tell them they were coming in. And that's when I was on the ground just after, you know, the bin Laden raid. What was amazing to me, all these Americans were like, how could you, you know, how, you know, so angered and so indignant and we trusted you. And, and all the uh, Pakistanis were like, how could you invade our sovereignty? And this is so, hum and you know, the, for them, the idea that bin Laden was there was really secondary to the idea that they were, had very much you know, been wounded yeah. in terms of but, having but their sovereignty. But it's also, I mean, the fact that, that there was a protection. Afghan war was greatly abetted on the part of the Taliban because they had a safe haven in North Waziristan, and, and the Americans always believed that the Pakistanis protected them, and there was Haqqani group, which had a relative freedom, and you guys know much more about this than I do. Let, let me ask you this, Charlie. Uh, you interviewed Henry Kissinger last night, I guess. I, I did, it was briefly, and it was about Maggie Thatcher. Yeah. But I was wondering, and I know you talk to him a lot, what does he think is going on in North Korea right now? I, <laughs> I, I, I think what he thinks, uh, I can't speak for him on, on that particular issue. Last night was just about Maggie Thatcher. Mm -hmm. We didn't get into North Korea, and, and it was about Margaret Thatcher. But, but well, what my, do you I mean, think, I think is going what, on what, in North what Korea? I find is I have interviewed other people in former envoy there. Uh, it, it is that it, they don't know. You know, but, but they keep raising the alert, and, and the, the South Koreans, who are the closest, are taking it seriously. Uh, and there was a report today uh, that this idea that this young leader uh, feels like that he has to show some sense of bona fides, that he belongs there because his grandfather was there and his father was there, you know, and it's almost like these regents uh, from the military, the power of the military, you know, and, and and it, it's, it's about like, you remember Barbara Tuckman's book, you know, about how World War I got started. People miscalculate, mm. and then somebody takes the wrong step, and somebody else reacts, and you're off to the races. And that's the great worry, mm -hmm. you know, that somebody does something thinking the other side won't react, you know. I mean, Saddam Hussein did not think that we were going to do what we did no. to the end. What's your take on that, Nancy? Just. Uh... On, on sort of what the... Well, I mean, you've been dealing with Iran, and, and uh, they're threatening to build a nuclear weapon, and uh, they keep going on and on. Uh, but the model here is that I think one of the things that's driving them is they think they're not taken seriously until they have a nuclear weapon, really, right. and they look to North Korea as the model. And, of course, we wouldn't... And, and Bob, just let me add to that. People say, what, you know, they look to the Middle East, and they say, if Gaddafi had had a, a nuclear weapon, what happened would not have happened. If Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. had a nuclear weapon, what mm -hmm. happened would not have happened, that kind of thing. 
people look at that and they say, and, and then they look around and they say, well, Israel has it and this, so and so has it, Pakistan, why shouldn't we have it? So well, what it's funny, in the it, Arab world, how is that being? It's funny you mentioned sort of unintended consequences because I would argue that Libya was a series of unintended consequences mm -hmm. that led to the instability of the whole region in North Africa. It's, why it's become a keystone for um, insurgent activity throughout, throughout North Africa. And so there seems to be this repeated mistake by the United States of unintended consequences, and frankly, it goes through Egypt as well. This idea that if you liberated um, uh, Egypt from Mubarak and that brought democracy, that, that everybody would be better off, and they're not better off. And in fact, I think the consistent um, thread that's running through the region right now because of these miscalculations is less U.S. influence in the entire region. It's breathtaking on how much U.S. influence has fallen in the region in just the last year. John Kerry comes through the Secretary of State and offers $250 million. That's the best he can put on the table. Obama goes to, goes to Israel, and, and, we, and there's not an ability to jumpstart a deal. We're still sort of using rhetoric to try to get back to the basics on, um, at, the, um, at the negotiating table. And so um, there has been, what we're watching now are the consequences of those miscalculations and, the, and those misreadings about what happens when you intervene, whether it be through um, uh, a no-fly zone, as, as in the case in Libya, and escalating it into um, uh, um, hitting uh, his targets to something as simple as backing um, the, the overthrow of, of the Mubarak regime. And so um, it, for, for the U.S. influence in the Arab world, it feels very tenuous because um, they just don't have the influence that they had a few years ago, the things that were leveraged just don't matter to, to, to people the way they did. And the consequence of Libya, I would argue, is further um, instability in Northern Africa because you're seeing um, more, of group, more of these terrorist groups emerging. And not just Al-Qaeda or AQIM, as we, as we refer to for, for that region, or the ones that you hear about, but literal micro groups that are emerging in the region that are trying to model themselves um, after Al-Qaeda. Al and they're not just terrorist groups. They're, they're becoming like Hezbollah providing um, social services and food in the absence of government. And so what I fear for the region is that we will um, find ourselves um, working with state and non-state actors for control of the mm. country because of these groups that are emerging. And, and their lesson from Iraq was you cannot just indiscriminately kill. You have to become a more sophisticated organization mm. after it has And they are. And when you talk about unintended consequences, when the Syrian protesters first took to the streets and, and people were being killed, they were willing to do it because there was not a shadow of doubt in their mind that NATO was going to come in on its hobby horse. Basically, the U.S. was going to come in and save the day and we give them a no-fly zone. Yeah. It, 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 it really didn't cross their minds. And about two or three months in, and people are dying, and more people are dying, and they're suddenly realizing, okay, the international community is not coming in, but there was a real moment when the penny dropped where they were like, oh, okay, this isn't going to happen. And when they saw what happened to Ambassador Chris Stevens, a lot of Syrians told me, that's it, that's the nail in the coffin for us, because now the genie's out and people know that actually, you know, you go and liberate a country and it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody there loves you and thanks you for it. They may turn around and assassinate your uh, ambassador there. Um, so it really did, the Arab Spring and the U.S. support of it, it did set off this sort of chain of dominoes that yeah. kind of... Yeah, but there's still time to, uh, to do something very decisive in, in Syria, I think. I hope so. And uh, Senator McCain and, and uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, even now that he's retired from the Senate, and others have advocated uh, a no-fly zone. A no-fly zone worked in Bosnia, a no-fly zone worked in Iraq. And it can work in Syria because it can do several things. One, it can, it, it can take away from the Syrians a huge strategic advantage they have, and that's that they have air power uh, to go and kill people uh, in, in massive numbers. And it can be something that can force uh, President Assad to uh, either negotiate or resign or realize how hopeless it is. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, in something like Syria, you have to take sides. Decisively, but, leading from behind doesn't work there. Charlie, you, we're, we're in your arena now because I mean, you talk to these people in Washington. Um, my impression is that Panetta, Clinton, mm -hmm. Petraeus recommended to the president do more than he's doing now. A lot more. A lot more. And the president was resistant because he said, "We're just getting out of war in Iraq and getting out of a war in Afghanistan, and there are unintended consequences if we do something." Clarissa and I have talked on on my evening program a number of times about this in, in, in lengthy conversations. I mean, you think it's essential now. And, and the question that it raises is, 
has the delay, was the t opportune time more, because what's happened with time, not only the tragedy of casualties on the ground, 70,000 mm. growing number mm. of Syrians, but also the inflow of people from outside. Absolutely. And so how do you take who, who a side? Are creating, Look uh, at Nusra Front. And, yeah. and this who, was who are not friends with the people who even started the rebellion. Absolutely. Extremism is not something that is inherent to Syrian culture. It, uh, Syrians are generally very moderate. They are you know, often devout or pious, but they are certainly not extremists. And after a while, and I had one Syrian man who put it to me like this. He said, if you're, you're reaching out to the US and you're drowning and you're saying, please help me, please help me, please help me, and the US says no, and then someone else reaches out their hand and you're drowning. And you may not like these people and what they stand for and you may not agree with their tactics and it may seem alien to your culture. But if you have a choice between drowning and grabbing someone's hand for help, you're going to grab their hand. And unfortunately, in the case of Syria, the hand that has been grabbed is the hand of radical uh, Islamists. Just the other day, Al-Nusra Front, which is an Islamist rebel group fighting on the ground, came out and said that they are officially now affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And this could, you know, I cannot, as a journalist, propagate one course of action or, 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 or not another, but this could have been avoided. I could say with great certainty from what I've seen on the ground. And my only concern when I look at how the US is responding or not responding to Syria is not that I want to say or advocate a policy of intervention uh, or any kind of policy, but not having a policy has consequences too. And at the moment, we don't really have a strong, coherent policy in terms of dealing with Syria. Not to act is to act. Let's uh, take some questions from the audience, and I hope we get some from the TCU. There are microphones right here. Tell us who you are. Yes, I'm, I'm Don Mitchell, uh, formerly a broadcaster from Anna, Illinois, a little town of 5,000. My question is for Charlie Rose. It seems to me that lack of confidence in our people, in our government pronouncements, is a pretty big problem. I think three-fourths of the people do not believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission, if I remember right. When, uh, when you interviewed the son of uh, Robert Kennedy, the, uh, not only the brother of the uh, assassinated president, but he was also attorney general. Uh, the headline the next morning was RFK skeptical of lone shooter. And it went on to say that according to his son, that uh, Robert Kennedy uh, felt that the Warren Commission, uh, in, in contrast to being a trusted uh, document, was a shoddy piece of workmanship and that he did not believe the lone shooter idea. And so I'm wondering, he, he was the brother of the president, uh, the attorney general. He also had um, his people investigate links between Oswald, CIA, Ruby and the mob, and found some connection there. Do you think we are ever going to get the truth about what really happened here in Dallas, Dallas, Fort Worth, 50 years ago? Well, I'm going to do the smartest thing I've done all evening. I'm going to defer to Bob Schieffer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm aware of those comments, but I, I, would, I, I would disagree with your premise. I, I do not think the Warren Commission report was a shoddy piece of work. Uh, I think it was a pretty good piece of work. Uh, I still, I was there, that doesn't mean I know all about it, but I was there when all of this happened and I've uh, kept up with it over the years. Uh, I am convinced that that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald pulled the trigger. He was a cold-blooded killer. I don't think there's any question about that. I have tried to keep an open mind as to whether someone else was involved. Someone else may well have been involved, but at this point, no one has prevented or presented evidence to me that convinced me that there was somebody else involved. I, I think there, there are gaps in the Warren Commission report. Uh, but so far, I think it's as close as uh, anybody's gotten to the truth. Now, this is my opinion, uh, uh, clearly stated, but that's just what I believe. Thank you. Uh, step right up. My name is Paul Oliver, 
Charlie Rose, you interviewed former Senator Mitchell. George Mitchell. George Mitchell, recently. Yes, sir. I was real impressed with his feeling and, and experience of what he knew has gone on in the past, what's going on now, and what he thinks will go on, particularly in the Far East. What was your take on his? You mean in the Middle East or in the, in, in the Middle East? Middle East, yes. Yeah. And what is your take on whether or not the United States should be involved in these foreign conflicts or should we pull everybody out like some people want to? He seemed to have it down pretty good. What was your take what, on what his? Do, what do you recollect him saying? Pardon? What, I'm, 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 what do you recollect him saying? What, is your, what was his point that he made that so resonated with you? His point was we have no choice but to be involved in practically every conflict that we've had in the past well, I, <laughs> and probably not going to yeah, be able no. to not be involved in the future. Let, let me, uh, I don't think he, has, he would have said that about every conflict, you know, and, and clearly there, there are lots of conflicts and it's hard to have one rule and one standard that fits all with respect to that. I mean, you, if you point out to how many people are dying in one place, people will say, well, look how many people are dying in the Congo, we're not doing anything about that. And clearly we know that nations act out of their own evaluation of their national, national security interests, that number one. Number two, uh, I do think, and I think Jen, uh, Mitchell thinks, and, and almost most of the people I know, including you know, Jim Baker from the great state of Texas, uh, believe that the United States has an important role to play in the world. Uh, we can't go and be the world's policeman anymore, but we do have a role to play. We have a role to play uh, in Asia, where Clarissa was a correspondent in Beijing. Clearly that, uh, because those countries there, whether it's India or Vietnam, are, are not necessarily uh, looking with great favor over the power of China, and they want to see the United States uh, develop a relationship with them uh, I think in the Middle East, uh, clearly there is, you know, we are known obviously as, and should be as a great friend of Israel, uh, but we have a role to play uh, in terms of, of the Middle East. We have been there, we have a role to play. Uh, what we hope will be, is, and it doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean we should do it alone, and it doesn't mean that we should do it militarily, and it doesn't mean that we should prop up uh, dictators who have no support from the people. But we do have a role, and I think that's what Senator Mitchell was expressing. He also talked about, you know, Israeli-Palestinian issues, and, and you know, there are real uh, questions there because of what is often known as a demographic argument. You know, that that if in fact uh, settlements grow, and it raises questions about uh, at what point will a two-state solution not be possible, and, and if that is true, can Israel have a state that is both Jewish and democratic, and if not. You know, what does that mean for the people of Israel as well as the neighbors? You know? Let's hear from some of these award-winning TCU journalists here. <laughs> well, just noting the uh, demographics of the audience tonight, we can definitely tell that uh, our group is clearly in the minority. <laughs> uh, based off that question, it seems that a lot of uh, the older demographics are the ones that tune in to CBS News, ABC, the Sunday shows. Uh, what can these kind of journalism programs do to engage young people and make news relevant to that demographic? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but. Yeah. Okay. but that was a bit. <laughs> but but uh, they, uh, let me, can I just say one thing, Bob? I mean, they should watch her and, and what she does because of how smart she is and how courageous she is and how good she is, not because of how old she is or how young she is. <laughs> You know, I mean, Thank I, you. <laughs> Can I just Look, say, nothing would make me happier than to see younger people interested in the work we do, and I think there is an interest there. I really do. I think people are curious about the world. I, I think things are changing. You know, the region that I'm in now and where, where my family comes from is so dynamic that people want to understand it. And I think our responsibility is to make those stories tangible. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think the best journalists don't try to show off what they know, but really try to educate and, 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 and empower people with what, what they learn. And I think if we do that, then maybe we'll appeal to younger demographics. But I, I find that when those are the stories that, that I can reach a wider audience with. And, so, and I think that's the best part of the job, really, is not to just go out and report about some protests that you saw, but to just think creatively. And I, I love that part of the job of, you know, when the Port Said um, fire started, 
the, you know, the, the judge said that the, the case file was banned from public, and I thought, really? <laughs> well, we ought to get our hands on that because you want to see it. So you just think out, it's the thinking outside the box and giving voice to people and um, that makes it so much fun. And, and I think people want to read good stories, and if you just consistently think creatively, I really think we'll reach a wider demographic because I think people want to know. I think they're tired of having these headlines thrown at them. I also think young people get their information in different ways. Like, yeah. I don't have a lot of friends who go home at 6.30 and, like, you know, switch on an evening news broadcast. Um, at the same time, I have a lot of friends who are they're getting their news online, they're aggregating from multiple different sources, they are regularly seeing my reports, even though they're not necessarily, it's like appointment viewing, let's sit in front of the box and watch it. So I think, I think we all uh, networks are really thinking very creatively about how to get their work out online more, get their work posted by other you know, bloggers, people like Drudge, the Drudge Report, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of hits that, that gets every day, but it really can sort of generate a lot of traffic for different pieces. But, but, but my, you know, let me just say one thing. I mean, from the minute I got into journalism, we've always been trying to figure out how to get younger people to watch the news. Mm. And, and basically, people watch the news because they need to watch the news. Uh, a lot of young people, uh, you know, uh, their parents are paying their college tuition. Uh, they're worried about their grades. They're uh, worried about the other sex from time to time <laughs> while, they're, while they're in college. Uh, but they don't really start worrying about how are my taxes going up or not until they get out and they're older, they're in the workforce after they marry, then they have children, and they start thinking about how can I have the same world for my children that I, that I enjoyed. Uh, it, you know, if you wanted to get young people to watch the news, you know how you could do it? Uh, Congress could pass a law reinstituting the military draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't want to do that. But it's just, it's just the point I'm trying to make. News programs exist to tell people what they need to know, and that's always our responsibility to try to, to, try to figure out how to do that. Bob, but, uh, yeah. can I add to that? Because I do think people are reading more because there's so many sources yeah. of news and they're coming at you in so many different ways and Facebook and Twitter and the sort of Google effect. And I think the responsibility for those of you who are interested in going into journalism is to not only read things that are sort of um, weeded to you through your friends and through the, the sort of the Google search that brings it up or your Twitter followers. But I think your responsibility is to get out of that bubble and read things from different viewpoints. Because what I worry about with, with our business is that we're being, we're now being expected to be advocates in, cause, in, your, in one's cause because there's an assumption of a liberal or conservative bias in news, a sort of polarization of the country, the expectation that it be in our news. And so I really make a point every morning to read stuff that's not on my Facebook or not on my Twitter feed so that I, have, that I can be a better journalist because what, we're not advocates in your cause. My only job is to, as creatively and thoughtfully as possible, tell you what's happening. And I think, I worry going forward that with mm. all the source of news, that you're going to feel that, that that's your expectation. And once you do, you lose objectivity and in a sense you lose reliability. So that would be... That would be my only sort of caveat. You Lauren, know, well, let me just say let Fred, about, Fred. You know the most reliable audience uh, for television news and television chat shows? It's retired people because they have the time to watch. They're interested. Mm. Uh, I'm for the draft, by the way, but, the, uh, <laughs> but not for the reason of getting more young people to watch. And I don't know, I think your implication was that television and print are doing something wrong by not attracting young people. And as Bob said, look, I've been through this with magazines and television trying to get a young audience. and. It's just not going to be there, period. Uh, I didn't watch stuff when I was in college. I didn't get a newspaper. M my son, when he went up, when he graduated from college, went off to Ohio to work in a congressional campaign, and I told him I would, I would uh, get delivered to him my favorite newspaper, the Wall Street Journal. And he said, Dad, don't bother. Just give me your password so I can get it online whenever I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren? My question is um, for Clarissa, but I think all of you could probably answer this. Um, in my news class, class here at TCU, our professor recently brought in a producer from Newtown, Connecticut, and she's won multiple awards for her um, work during the Sandy Hook tragedy. Um, and she talked about rising above all of that and being able mm. to lead her team mm. during that time. So how do you res rise above that? Um, you know, I try to think of it a, like 
what I imagine how doctors feel sometimes, where you're in a situation that is so horrifying that you're like, okay, I am not going to address any of this emotionally or really deal with it. I am just going to take a deep breath and maintain my calm and my focus and think about like laser beam, think about what I need to do in this situation, both in terms of maintaining security, but also in terms of it's very easy when you get so flustered or something so horrifying that you, um, you sort of forget what you're supposed to be doing. Like, so um, I try, and I also feel like it's more helpful if everybody around you is, is losing it and is, is, you know, is sometimes after these bombings, people are hysterically crying. People, I've been in a room where women were tearing clumps of their hair out because um, they had just found out that the man at the house where I was living had been killed. And you just have to sit there and, you know, I mean, occasionally if you, if you, you know, if you need to give someone a hug, you need to give someone a hug or whatever, you, you know, whatever feels right in the situation, but you have to be like a doctor, be professional, keep it together, and then, you know, when you get home and you open a bottle of Jack Daniels, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> And you can lose it, but while you're there in the moment, you really just, if you can't keep it together, then it's not the job for you. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, let me just add to that, Lauren. David Martin, who's our Pentagon correspondent, told me a story one time on 9-11. He was approaching the Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon parking lot, when he saw this huge uh, smoke thing. Uh, and he thought that an oil tanker or something had overturned out on, on the... Uh, uh, the Beltway Loop there on the other side of the Pentagon. And obviously what had happened it was when that plane crashed into the Pentagon on the other side of the Pentagon. And he said he parked his car as quickly as he could. He got out and he ran up on the lawn and there was all this smoke, you know, this heavy smoke and he found himself and he stumbled on a body. And then he stumbled on another body. And he said, my God, he said, I, I, I couldn't figure, I didn't know what I was in the middle of. I didn't want, know what had happened. And he said, I, I, I just almost lost it. And he said, I'm embarrassed to say, well, he shouldn't have been. He said, then my instinct, my reporter instincts and my training kicked in and I started counting the bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what reporters do. Mm -hmm. That's how you get through mm -hmm. just what Clarissa mm -hmm. is talking about. You've been taught to do it. It's why I've always said, because I started out as a police reporter, it is the best training you can get for anything. Uh, you know, if you're a sports writer, they give you the best seat in the house. They give you a buffet. They have somebody there to help you get the stats. They're proud to see you. But when you're covering a police story, you're walking in on the worst moment in someone's life. Mm. And if you can conduct your business in a business-like way under those circumstances, then the rest of it is easy. Yeah, but that's how reporters operate. And I mean, these two, I mean, are just an example of what it takes uh, to be a reporter. You know, we're all used to just picking up the paper or turning on the television and seeing the news. And what we should never forget is that there are people like this who are willing to literally risk their lives over and over again to go out and get the true story, not to tell somebody else's version of it, but to get close enough to the story that they can see it with their own eyes and make their own judgments. And as long as we have people like these two, uh, we're going to be all right in the world of journalism. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something real quick? Yeah. Nancy wants to say something. You know, I lived in Iraq from 2003 to 2007, and I managed a staff of 20 Iraqis. And that was, of course, the worst of the violence. I mean, our job was to count bodies. You'd count shoes at bombings. You'd look for the head for the suicide bomber because it pops off like a corkscrew. I don't know if that's too graphic. but. You end up learning how to bifurcate your brain between sort of your normal life and your war life. And what you come to realize is that the Iraqis are depending on you to hold it together because they need it as much as you do and you feel a responsibility to them. And the reality is if you're going to put yourself in that situation, if you're going to put your family through the constant worry of whether you're going to come out dead or alive, if you're going to ask the Iraqis to go out, then the least you can do is give that story everything you got. And that's what gets you through it because that's what you're there for. It's not about you, and mm -hmm. you're always aware that no matter how bad it is, you have the option to leave. No matter how bad it got in Iraq, I had the option to leave. And these are people watching their country fall apart and don't have the option mm -hmm. to leave. And that supersedes everything. And that's 
that's really how you get through it. So when you're in it, you're not even thinking consciously mm -hmm. about it. You're just charging through because you have, you, people are counting on you to do it. Not just, not just the, the readers, but the people all around you. They need you to stay together to survive it as well. Next question, yeah, well said. Uh, this question is uh, Clarissa Ward about Lebanon. Mm. Uh, in your opinion, what are the prospects of the conflict in Syria adversely affecting Lebanon? Uh, prognosis not good. Yeah, um, I mean it's really uh, it's already happening. You're seeing. I mean, Lebanon has always been a very factionalized society. It's a tiny country. It's always been dominated by Syria historically as well, and you have this kind of ethnic divide between, or sectarian divide rather, between uh, Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims, and then Christians. So it's a country of minorities without a clear majority. Lebanon also had a 15-year civil war. Um, and what you're starting to see are instances where uh, the Syrian government has even bombed areas inside the Lebanese border, uh, allegedly to sort of take out um, Lebanese radical Islamists who are fighting with the rebels inside Syria. And then, of course, you have uh, Sunni Muslims who come out and demonstrate, and then the Shiite Muslims come out and demonstrate against the, the Sunni Muslims. And before you know it, you're kind of dangerously close to spiraling back down that sort of sectarian warfare, um, it, which has been such a dangerous trend for Lebanon historically. And it's not just Lebanon. I mean, this is what is really, really of such great concern about Syria. You don't just ignore Syria and the problem solves itself. You ignore Syria and the whole region, the whole region goes up in smoke because these sectarian divisions that exist, these are 1,500 years old and they are deep, and, and these people are ready. If, if, if It's like a powder keg, and if the flame is there, things can go off, not just in Lebanon, also in Jordan, uh, and across the region, and, um, and that potentially would be explosive and so dangerous for the entire international community. So again, it's like the ramifications of not dealing with Syria are potentially huge for every country in the international community. It's the same reason that there's a huge, he mentioned, Bob mentioned Kissinger and, and Jim Baker and others are, are trying to argue very strongly, you know, beyond the imperative of, of doing something, whether it's a no-fly no, no zone, but trying to get the Russians involved and try to get, and even Iran, who was a state interest there on the other side, trying to get some sense of, of people from the outside coming in uh, and trying, and, and getting uh, some degree of, talks going on. You've got the problem that the rebels don't want to talk to Assad for, for very good reasons, and now they don't even want to talk to each other. Uh, but there is, in Afghanistan and in Syria, uh, a lot of serious people trying to figure out some way to get uh, p parties outside to play a role, yeah, because but they the, have contacts inside. At the end of the day, there is no substitute for American leadership, none. But if I could just say one thing, speaking to your earlier point, uh, Fred, about mm -hmm. a no-fly zone, because obviously, you know, I've looked into this a lot for my work, and the one thing that's very complicated about a no-fly zone in Syria is that President Assad does have a very sophisticated anti-aircraft uh, system, and he's rather uh, cleverly or cunningly put them, installed them in, in, in civilian areas. So in the days precipitating the sort of creation of a no-fly zone, you would have to have a massive <coughs> bombardment um, of Syria, and likely there would be a, a huge amount of civilian casualties as part of uh, collateral damage, in a sense, because these installations are um, in heavily populated areas. So, um, you know, while I would absolutely agree that there would be nothing better than to think that there was some place in this country that these people could go to where they weren't afraid that a fighter jet was going to come and drop a bomb on their head, um, I gather from military experts that I've mm -hmm. spoken to that it is quite complicated and potentially uh, costly both in terms of money but also uh, more importantly in terms of human life. What would really be costly for Assad is if he shot down an American plane. That would be just like Saddam. He didn't send up his air force mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the first Iraq war. Uh, the Syrians didn't do anything after the Israelis, what, a year, year and a half ago, bombed their uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear facility that was being built. So, look, I, I don't know that he wouldn't uh, shoot down an American plane, but uh, he would, uh, it would be a mistake if he did, and I suspect he realizes that. 
Right. Good evening. My name is Rajni Doyev. I'm a journalist from Russia. And my question is about U.S.-Russian relations. Everyone admit that um, the reset that was launched by Mr. Medvedev and Mr. Obama has finally failed. And Mr. Putin is not so open and not so liberal. He's Mr. Medvedev. Uh, how do you think our Russian-U.S. relations will change in a couple of years? And um, how Mr. Obama and his administration should try to improve the situation? Thanks. Well, Clarissa, why don't you talk about that a little? Uh, Clarissa was the Moscow. correspondent in uh, Moscow for two years for ABC, I guess. Yeah, I was there when we hit the reset button, but um, I'm not sure ultimately how effective um, hitting that reset button has been. I mean, I think that the issue you have at the moment, obviously, you have this fundamental, um, you know, uh, difference of opinions uh, in the world between the US and the West and India and China and Russia, less so India. Let's take Russia and China. Russia and China look at what they see happening as a result of the Arab Spring and they think, we want no part of this. The idea of like public protests leading to the collapse of a dictatorship and, uh, and potential democracy um, is something that they fundamentally, uh, it, they d totally disagree with it. They act on the premise that countries should basically mind their own business and, and pay attention to running their own countries and not get involved um, with what other countries are doing. So uh, on, on a fundamental level, there is just a, an ideological chasm between the way the US sees the world and the way Russia sees the world. Um, and, and there's nothing that you're gonna do that's gonna change that. And as you well know, there's nothing that irritates the Russians more than when the, and it's the same with the Chinese, because I was based in China as well, than when the Americans start talking about human rights and, and you know, and you, you, know, you don't let your people look on the internet or you crack down on NGOs, as might be the case in Russia, uh, because there's a perceived hypocrisy there, because it's like, well, you invaded two countries, so. Um, uh, you know, you have these two fundamentally different mindsets and different understandings and perceptions of the world. But having said that, I think at the end of the day, there are these key issues that the Russians and the Americans are working very closely on. Uh, right. You know, nuclear weapons being, of course, uh, I think at the you know the START treaty has managed to survive every little battle. Um, and I actually think that Russia right now is really more focused on Russia than it is on America or uh, you know, on having a sort of big role in the international community. Um, Putin is really interested in, you know, he's consolidating power in his own ways and, and he's managing to do it so he's just sort of slipping below the radar and not getting into a lot of trouble with the international community. Um, so I think it's a tricky relationship. I don't think it's a relationship that's in danger of, uh, of, of disintegrating by any stretch because at the end of the day, when you're dealing with Syria and these places, you know, even if Russia's the bad guy, Russia is the one that the US can sit down with and have a discussion with. And ultimately, I think that Russia, if we're to deal effectively with Syria, that is not going to happen without Russia's participation. Yeah. And that might be a bitter pill for the U.S. to swallow, but it's the reality of the new world we live in. I mean, I, I, we live in a multipolar world. There, there is some evidence that the Russians, with respect to Syria, I mean, they, you know, they they clearly have said Assad does not have asylum in there. They clearly have said to to stay away from the chemical weapons. I mean, it, they, in my impression, and in, in conversation with the foreign minister of Russia and others, uh, and the ambassador to the United Nations, that they've moved a little bit away from sort of this of full-out support of Assad. And they make a distinction between Syria and Assad. And, and, and in addition to that, they were basically, they looked at Libya as a disaster for mm. them and, and thought that they were sort of tricked or whatever. And so they, when they think of Syria, they think of Libya where they were not part of it. Which is why it would be very hard to get the UN vote passed exactly. through for a yeah. no fly Exactly zone. right. So. So, so I mean, the argument is to, you have something that has not, doesn't come out of the Security Council and somehow they're, Russia it is. I mean, you need to speak to who speaks to Azad if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the interesting thing, Clarissa and I had a conversation about, which is the two questions I have that interest me most. Number one is whether she and, and both of you believe that Assad has more staying power than we believed hmm. early on, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and the other thing that we haven't talked about is Egypt, where, I mean, you've got whether the army at some point will simply uh, if things get to a certain level, will the army do something? And you're in Cairo. You, yeah. 
Maybe we ought to go uh, just let Nancy talk right. a little mm. bit about that because we really haven't talked about Egypt and what's the, what's the deal there. Well, you know, Egypt's in a period of persistent instability right now. And the country's collapsing. I would, it's not a failed state but I, yet. I don't know how you call it. Well, I don't know how you define it as a failed state, but it's certainly failing politically, economically, and socially. You know, even, and we can go through each of them politically, you know, the reality is Mohamed Morsi was democratically elected, and yet the opposition still feels that there's a fight to be had over control of the country, that the fight's not over yet. And so they haven't, in a sense, accepted the result. At the same time, Morsi sees himself not as a national leader, but really as advancing the interests of the Brotherhood. And both sides fear each other. You know, it's sort of like the problems that Obama's having with Congress. Somebody has to be the bigger man and, and, and make concessions to the other, and neither side's really ready to do it yet because neither one trusts the other. And so there's a real sense that there's nobody really leading the country because the, op the opposition's fighting for control and Morsi hasn't taken control of the country. Um, he is not a national leader. I'll give you a very simple example. The under-20 soccer league won the national championship, Africa Cup championship, and he doesn't even sort of acknowledge their, 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 their win. You know, he doesn't, but the minute there's an attack on the Muslim Brotherhood's interest, he's out there. He's not unifying the country. He's not a national leader. And so the state is collapsing. Now, uh, that is, we don't have police services. We don't have the traditional government services the way that we once did. Economically, the Egyptian pound is falling almost daily. Mm. And this is a country where, for most people, fruit is a luxury. And now tomatoes are, too, because they can't afford them. And the IMF loan that, that they're trying to get for $4.8 billion requires them to make very serious concessions that politically he cannot do to end subsidies that are keeping maybe millions of people alive. And so he can't do it. And that's led to a social collapse, things that would have never happened in Egypt before the revolution. Um, happen all the time. I think the one that you've heard about the most is the sexual harassment that goes on. Because, you know, before there was a sense of national pride that you, you there were cat calls and everything else, but grabbing of women, raping of women, assault, groping of women in public, it didn't happen because Egypt's national pride was at stake in a country that was dependent on tourism, as much as a quarter of all jobs came out of tourism. And with the first two things collapsing, the third is collapsing as well. If you have no police who are there to stop, the, the, the groping of women, and in some cases participate in it, it, it happens more, 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 pre more commonly. To the question of whether, whether the military is going to get involved, you know, we're not at a point yet where Morsi's lost all support. He started out at 75% approval rating, according to a Gallup poll, he's now at 43. And so I don't think it's yet at a point where, where the military would get involved, but we're certainly, he's working consistently to get there every day, so um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, and I should, tell you, I should tell you, by the way, Egypt's, I'm Egyptian, and I'm related to probably half the people in that country, and I'm telling you it is the most unpredictable place on earth. The minute you think you understand it, it will pull something on you. I, I, I've never, I mean, I'm, I've never seen anything like it. So the prevailing thinking, and this is subject to change, is that we're approaching a hunger revolution, that the, that the, that the revolution that was driven by the middle class in 2011 and 2013, 14, will be driven by poor people who simply cannot afford to eat. And that, uh, that at that point, we'll, because this summer, we'll, we'll really start to see it. I, I live in the Tonius neighborhood in Cairo, and I lose power once in every hour, or one hour every day in March, with, no air, with the air conditioning not running. This summer, we're, we're talking about five or six hours a day. People cannot afford to eat. And so I think there's gonna see, we're going to see that mounting frustration on the street. And, and that that will lead to a tipping point where the military will get involved. But remember, the military doesn't want to get into the business of politics. They weren't very good at it the first time. Remember, they ran things after um, Mubarak's um, re resignation. And, and it's a very dangerous game once you start usurping the democratic process that happened a year ago. Morsi still has several more years on his term, and yet there's a feeling that what's going on now is not tenable. So the, the, the short answer is there is a feeling that we are approaching a breaking point, but when it hits and what it looks like, um, nobody knows. There was some hope at some point that Islamist governments, if they came to power, would be, in a sense, influenced by having power and the responsibility of providing food and transportation and, and all that, that that act of governing might have an impact, but it doesn't look like it happened. You know, it's funny, when they took power, people were more concerned about the Islamization of the country, and it turns out it was the incompetence that was the bigger problem. Mm. And, and to, in their defense, you know, they are not taking over the most efficient state. I mean, it is, a, it is a government built on inefficiency and corruption because that was how people got bribes. 
That said, they cannot recruit the top minds because people who could help fix the problem don't want to be affiliated with the Brotherhood. And so the guy who's in charge of economics was an engineer before. Well, he's not going to come up with great ideas. The prime minister was in charge of water. It was, a water, it was an engineer in water, in, in water irrigation. He's not going to come up with the greatest ideas. And so that, that's why we're at this point, because nobody, there are great minds there, mm. but they don't want to be affiliated with the brother. And then there is a whole sect of people who, who, who want to see Egypt fail because they were affiliated with Mubarak and really, really hate the idea of their arch enemy, the Muslim Brotherhood, taking over. I mean, I heard a rumor the other day, and this is Egypt, so who knows if it's true or not, that you know Mubarak is in a military prison and he takes a walker on the ground three times a week, and when he does, the patients and doctors throw candy at him because they want him back. Hmm. It took two years to get to that point. So it's not Islamization, it's incompetence that we're worried about now. Well, folks, I, as they say at the football game, I'm afraid the time has run out. You all have been wonderful tonight. Uh, we obviously didn't solve all the problems. Thank you.